uh, public service announcement is brought to you by Pepsi, the choice of a new generation. Um, all preachers have little pet peeves and things that irk them that we usually try to have grace about and not say much about, but there's something that's been bothering me here of late that I thought I'd say something, and I'm just asking for the help of you parents especially. But uh, during our services, we have way too much of people getting up and walking in and out of the services, uh, both adults and young people. Now, I realize sometimes the mothers may get called back to the nursery, and I'm certainly not talking to you ladies that need to go back to the nursery for any reason. But as far as the children especially, uh, it's a distraction to me as the preacher, and it's a distraction to the audience as well, especially in a room that's this small. And so uh, I, I realize you may have a child you're trying to potty train and things like that. That's fine. Um, I'm not saying that absolutely never do it, but as much as possible, if we could restrain getting up and walking out of the services as much as possible. I ask for you to use the restroom, uh, get a drink of water prior to the service. Uh, if you need to take your children to the bathroom, try to do that prior to the service. So that once the preaching starts, the sole focus of every a bit of our attention is upon the Word of God and what God has for us. And there may be some exceptions that come up where you need to go out. That's fine. I understand. But as a rule, let's just try to uh, limit the getting up and going out as far as uh, that goes. And so uh, that's your public service announcement. Make sure you grab a bottle of Pepsi after church today. Amen? All right. Now, uh, when I was in West Virginia... Um, I saw this, and when I saw this, I had to buy it, and this is this is going to hang prominently on my refrigerator at home because I am a native of West Virginia, so I kind of resemble this remark. But it says, you know you're from West Virginia if your dad walks you to school because you're in the same grade. <laughs> you know you're from West Virginia if your family tree is a straight line. <laughs> you know you're from West Virginia... If you have a brother named Bubba, Jr., or Jim Bob, you know that you're from West Virginia if you consider a six-pack of beer and a bug zapper to be quality entertainment. You know you're from West Virginia if your front porch collapses and kills more than one dog. <laughs> uh, no, more than three dogs. I'm sorry. More than three dogs. No doubt. Um, you know you're from West Virginia if you've ever worn a tube top to a wedding. Um, you know you're from West Virginia if your mother has ever been in a fist fight at a high school sports event. You know you're from West Virginia if you prominently display a gift you bought at Graceland, that's Elvis's mansion. And you know that you're uh, from West Virginia if you think potted meat on a saltine cracker is an hors d'oeuvre. <laughs> and so uh, I saw that and I said, you know what, uh, I'm getting that. Uh, if for nothing else, for the very first one that says you know you're from West Virginia if your dad walks you to school because you're in the same grade. That, that's his classic. Now, this email was sent to me. Uh, who sent me this? Well, it says I sent it to me, but I know that's not true. Um, I must have forwarded it to myself, but I got it from Jeff Olson, I think, over in North Dakota. Heavenly Humor. It says, One Sunday, a pastor told his congregation that the church needed some extra money and asked the people to prayerfully consider giving a little extra in the offering plate. He said that whosoever gave the most would be able to pick out three hymns after the offering plates were passed, the pastor glanced down and noticed that someone had placed a $1,000 bill in the offering. Now, I would say, don't you get no ideas, but hey, get some ideas. No. Uh, he was so excited that he immediately shared his joy with his congregation and said he'd like to personally thank the person who placed the money in the plate. A very quiet, elderly, saintly lady, all the way in the back, shyly raised her hand. The pastor asked her to come to the front. Slowly, she made her way to the pastor. He told her how wonderful it was that she gave so much in Thanksgiving and asked her to pick out three hymns. Her eyes brightened and she looked over the congregation and pointed to the three handsomest men in the building and said, I'll take him, him, and him. <laughs> and so you young ladies, Stephanie, Nicole, Tanya, y'all give a thousand dollars this morning. Who's, a, who's another single lady in here? Uh, and we'll let you ladies pick out the three handsomest men. Now, the handsomest man's already taken, so Angie won't let you have me. But, uh, but after that, though, we'll, we'll see if you get to pick out the three handsomest hymns in the building. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's get with some preaching before we get in trouble here. That's right. Let's take our Bibles this morning come to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I want to say that it's good to be back home again. We enjoyed our trip home to visit with my family and so forth and to get to see my grandfather one last time, but... Uh, uh, truly, there's no place like home, and uh, West Virginia was where I was born and raised, but no doubt uh, the calling of God is what causes Yuma to be home. And so it's uh, good to be back with you folks again. 
Uh, I do want to thank everyone that uh, filled in for me in one capacity or another. Uh, Brother Mario did a Sunday school while I was gone. Uh, Brother uh, uh, Jimmy, I believe, did a Sunday school while I was gone. Daniel covered a Wednesday night. Uh, Brother Joe preached a few times as far as the preaching services are concerned. And so uh, I thank everyone who helped out. Uh, Sister Rebecca was a blessing covering my wife's Sunday school class. Uh, Sister, thank you very much for that. And so uh, everyone was a real blessing, and I appreciate all your prayers and so forth. And uh, But it's good to be home. All right, Second Timothy <clears throat> chapter 2 this morning. The Bible says in verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That verse is important because all the new Bibles have changed it. None of the new Bibles tell you to study. Um, the NIV says, do your best to show yourself approved unto God. But it doesn't tell you what to do your best at. Um, the New King James says to be diligent to show yourself approved unto God. But it doesn't tell you what to be diligent at. Um, all the new Bibles have taken away the statement that says rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, they say something to the effect of correctly handling the word of truth. Well, brethren, you can't correctly handle the word of truth unless you rightly divide the word of truth. There's divisions in God's word, and God expects for you to recognize those divisions, and you ignore those divisions to your own peril. And so study to show myself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing uh, the word of truth. It says, verse 16, but shun profane and vain babblings. Well, you're going to have to turn your TV set off then. You're going to have to shut off your radio. You're going to have to probably close down the internet because uh, that's all those things are full of is profane and vain babblings. For they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and have overthrown the faith of some. Uh, you can say what you want to. Uh, uh, some of these radio preachers and TV preachers and things like that, the different heresies they've propagated have overthrown the faith of some. And so it says, uh, verse 19, though, <clears throat> Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. The foundation of God standeth sure because Jesus Christ is that foundation. Amen. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Right. And so the foundation of God standeth sure because Jesus Christ, or Christ rather, is the rock of that salvation. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His. Notice that. The Lord knoweth them that are His. Now, I like that. You know why I like that? Because of this. In witnessing to people and handing out tracts and things like that, I frequently encounter people who will refuse the tract and say, Oh, I know the Lord. I know the Lord. Now, it's a strange thing for me that someone who knows the Lord would reject a tract. Sit down, Jesse. Sit down. And so, it's a strange thing for me that someone who says they know the Lord would reject something about the Lord, as far as a gospel track and so forth. And so, that's kind of a strange thing. And so, when they say that they know the Lord, I wonder, does the Lord know them? See, the Bible says the Lord knows them that are His. And let him that, uh, that, 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 that knows the Lord depart from iniquity. He says there, uh, verse uh, 19, The Lord knoweth them that are His, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold <clears throat> and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. We think of uh, 1 Corinthians 3 again, as far as the judgment seat of Christ. The Bible says, as far as gold and silver and precious stones in regards to faithful service. And then he talks about wood, hay, and stubble, of course, representing unfaithful service. And so uh, even here in 2 Timothy, we're reminded that in a great house within the body of Christ, there are those that are faithful, and there are those that are not. And so the Bible says in verse 21, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. If you want to be used by God, one of the first things you need to understand is this, God isn't going to use a dirty vessel. God wants a clean vessel. And so if it's the desire of your heart to be used of God, then you must make an effort on your part to purge yourself from your iniquities and clean up your act so that you can be a vessel that God can use. Now, I'm not talking about cleaning up your act to get saved. You can't clean up your act to get saved, can you? No, God has to clean up your act for you to be saved. 
But listen here, after you get saved, God expects for you to clean up your act. And so you need to clean up your vessel so that you can be a vessel that can be used of God. The Bible says in verse 22, Flee also youthful lusts, but follow after righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call upon the Lord out of a pure heart. Now watch verse 23 here. <clears throat> but foolish and unlearned questions avoid, 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 knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Now notice in verse 23, it says, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. Now brethren, the subject of questions, questions, you know, the Bible uh, is a book full of questions. All the way back in Genesis chapter 3, a question is asked in chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Yea, hath God said. Uh, listen here. Uh, the very first question that's ever asked in the Bible is asked by the devil himself. And the devil's good at asking questions because when you ask questions, you have the ability to cast doubt on something. Notice the devil said, Yea, hath God said. In other words, has God really said that, Eve, or has he maybe said something else? Causing Eve to doubt in her own mind about what God had really said. Um, the first question that's ever asked by God in the Bible is found in chapter 3 as well. Because after Adam and Eve have partaken of the fruit and their eyes are open and they know the difference between good and evil, the Bible says they went and hid themselves and so forth. And God came walking in the garden in the cool of the day and he called out to the man and said, Where art thou? Where art thou? God knew where the man was. God full well knew where the man was. But he was giving the man an opportunity to get right over the wrong he'd done. He said, Where art thou? In Genesis chapter 3, you find God seeking man. But over in Matthew chapter 1, you find man seeking God. Because in Matthew chapter 1, those wise men show up and they say this. They say, where is he that is king of the Jews? And so someone said one time, wise men still seek Jesus. That's true. Amen. Wise men do still seek Jesus. But the Bible is a book of questions. And listen, even in life, we encounter questions, don't we? If you do any kind of personal work at all as far as handing out tracts and witnessing or preaching on the streets or going to the jail or going to the mission or just talking to your co-workers or your loved ones, if you do any kind of evangelistic work at all, there's questions that come up, aren't there? But here it says this. It says, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender strikes. Uh, what's a foolish and unlearned question? You know, uh, someone said that there's no such thing as a foolish question. Well, they haven't read their Bible because the Bible said foolish and unlearned questions avoid. And so if you're told to avoid it, it must exist. Uh, there's no such thing as a stupid question. According to the Bible, there is. Uh, listen here. You can always mark a stupid question by uh, this when it's a question that's asked from an unsincere heart that truly doesn't desire the truth. It's kind of like the person that says, can God do anything? Well, as a Christian, your first inclination is to say, well, of course, God can do anything. Uh, God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. Uh, listen here. Uh, God can, uh, he's uh, um, omnipotent. He's all-powerful. Uh, he's omnipresent. He's everywhere at one time. Of course, God can do anything. And then the person comes back as well. Can God make a rock so big that he can't pick it up? And you're left scratching your head going, isn't it lunchtime? <laughs> Can God, can God make a rock so big? Well, yeah, yeah, God can make a big rock. He can make as big a rock as He wants, but could He make it so big that He can't let... Uh, and, and so, listen here. You know what that is? That's a foolish and unlearned question. You know why? The person who's asked that question is not truly seeking an answer. Right. All they're doing is trying to give you something that will cause you to contradict yourself as far as your faith in God. Therefore, you shouldn't even waste time with questions like that. Foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender strifes. Or it's like the other idiot that said this. Can God do anything? Well, sure, God can do anything. Well, can God take a stone and skip it across the Atlantic Ocean? <laughs> I mean, the Atlantic Ocean, I mean, how many thousands of miles wide is the Atlantic Ocean? 
I mean, you can say what you want to, between the coast of New England and Great Britain, there's a whole lot of water. I don't know how much water, I just know it's a lot. And so, uh, can God skip a stone across the Atlantic Ocean? Uh, no, it's against God's character to do something that stupid. Amen. It's against God's character to do something that trivial. And God's not going to do something that moronic just to please an idiot like you. <laughs> So can God do anything? Uh, no, there's some. Let's just be honest. There's some things that God can't do. Right. When we look at our Bible, the Bible tells us in Titus chapter one, verse two, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie Amen. promised before the world began. God can't lie, folks. Right. I tell you another thing: God can't do. God can't save a dishonest person who's asking stupid questions like that. Amen. Because God won't save you against your will. I'm sorry, Calvin was wrong. Predestination and all that stuff was there. Predestination, the Bible, applies to the saved. It doesn't apply to the lost folks. Listen here, if you're lost here this morning, you're a moral free agent, you've got the right to choose or to reject. And God will not override that free will. That's why that Bible says, whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life, what? Freely. 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 You've got to choose. And you've got the right to choose against God if you want to. Jesus said there in Matthew 23 to those Jews, He said, How often would I have gathered you together as a hen doth gather her chicks, and ye would not. Jesus said, I would, but He says, ye would not. Don't tell me man doesn't have a free will. Man does have a free will. But the Bible warns us here to avoid foolish and unlearned questions. Notice uh, in 1 Timothy, we're in 2 Timothy, turn back a couple pages and come to 1 Timothy. And look at chapter uh, chapter number 1 here in 1 Timothy. It says, uh, verse 2, Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest uh, charge some, that they teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. Now notice that. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies. Uh, when you start studying some strange new doctrine that causes more questions than it causes answers, you better leave that thing alone. Right. Some folks have tried to get so deep, deep, they want to seek out the deeper things of God. I think some folks go deeper than God goes. Even God doesn't go as deep as what some folks go. And so listen here, when you start... It, looking at something, some fable, some genealogy like the Bible says there, or some new doctrine that some guys come up with, if it causes more questions than it causes answers from that Bible, you better leave that thing alone until God decides to reveal more about it. Amen. And maybe God will choose to, maybe He won't, but until He does, you better leave it alone. And so He says here, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying. The stuff that you're studying... The things you're spending time with, is it edifying you or is it causing confusion? Some folks are messing with stuff that's so deep, all it's doing is causing confusion. God ain't in that. God is not the author of confusion. You better leave that confusing stuff alone and get your nose in something that will edify you and build you up in your faith in Jesus Christ. Over in Proverbs chapter 26, we see this as far as the issue of questions. Proverbs chapter 26. And this is something that we all need to get down. I wish I had this verse down. I don't have this one down. Maybe you do, but I don't. There's some parts of the Bible that I just have a hard time with. And this is one of them. Here in Proverbs 26, in verse number 4, it says this, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou be like unto him. How many of you this morning with a raised hand can say that you've let a fool draw you into his folly before? I know that I've done that on a multitude of occasions. Let me tell you something. If you've ever witnessed to somebody, you've violated that verse. Because listen here, uh, when, you, when you come across that Campbellite who's this adamant and, 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 and dead set in his mind that you're saved by water and not by the blood, you can say what you want to. That's a fool. Why even waste time answering him? Because he's going to draw you into his folly and you'll be the fool before it's over with. Jehovah Witnesses, and especially JWs, they are experts at getting you to answer a fool according to his folly. And so, notice, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou be like unto him. Now look at the next verse, though. How do you reconcile verse 5 with verse 4? Verse 5 says, answer a fool. 
But wait a minute. Verse 4 said, answer not a fool. Verse 5 says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. And so notice one verse tells you not to answer the fool. Uh, the other verse tells you to answer the fool. And listen here, happy is the man that can discern the difference between the two. Because you know what? There's a time to give an answer and there's a time to shut up. You know what? We're probably more guilty of giving the answer that we shouldn't give than we are of shutting up. <laughs> and so listen here. Uh, how do you draw the line? Well, here's how I draw the line. When I know I'm dealing with someone who's already made up their mind, don't confuse me with the facts, what's the point? What's the point? Because if I continue to debate the cause with this individual, more likely than not, he's going to draw me into his folly and make a fool out of me before it's over with. But on the other hand, on the other hand, when his deception is in danger of affecting someone else. In other words, if I'm talking to that JW that, yeah, he's set in his ways, but there's other people viewing this conversation that don't understand the issue for the sake of those who are in ignorance, then you know what? I will answer that fool, lest that fool be wise in his own conceit. Amen. I remember one time, um, Brother Larry was dealing with one of his next door neighbors. I can't remember what her name was, but she was having Mormons come and visit with her and so forth. And so uh, uh, one Saturday afternoon, I was at the house and Larry called me up and said, Hey, uh, the Mormons are here at this lady's house. Can you come over? And so I grabbed my, my, my two six-shooters, jumped on my stallion, and I went, Hail Silver! Away! And I rode my white steed all the way over to Larry's house. No, actually, I, I got my beat-up uh, 91 Dodge Caravan or Plymouth Voyager and drove over. <laughs> but we got there, and here, here's about four or five of these guys. A bunch of them, wasn't just two of them, and, uh, and, and they weren't just kids either. You know how they wear their little elder name tags? You know, they're Elder Jones or Elder Smith, and they're 19 years old. <laughs> I had one joker come to my house one time. Uh, I said, what's your name? He says, my name's Elder, whatever it was, Jones or whatever it was. I said, Elder. I said, how old are you? He goes, 19. And I started laughing at him because I was 27 at the time. I said, 19? I'm 27. I'm your elder, bucko. <laughs> he didn't like that, though. But I get there, and here's these, these, these five Mormons. And one of them was an older guy. He was probably like, what, mid-40s or something like that? You know, and so I'd never seen a, a fellow that old with a white shirt and a tie before. And so, uh, nevertheless, though, here, here's four or five of them there. And so, you know what? When, when we got there, I started talking to her. Didn't he care about them? Because you know what? I'm not convincing them of nothing. I'm not going to convince them of squat. But for the sake of that woman, we did everything we could to help her understand those people were lying to her and misleading her. But you know what? She wouldn't listen. And as far as I know, she went on with them. Did she get baptized in the Mormon church or something like that, Larry? And so uh, we did everything we could to help open that woman's eyes to the truth. Uh, listen here. They'll never forget that afternoon because when they went inside her, uh, her apartment, and so forth. All five of them went inside this woman with her apartment and so forth. Uh, man, I, I came down and knelt down right beside her door and prayed with the loudest street preaching voice I could pray with and prayed that God would kill them all and curse them all Amen. as far as those Mormons. That's right, son. They'll never forget that afternoon. Amen. Larry's neighbors probably won't forget it either. What is that nut over there doing? <laughs> but that's right, son. I tell you what. They needed to know there's a... Uh, listen, she needed to know for sure... There's a difference between that phony garbage that Amen. the Mormons are putting out and the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ is found right. in a 1611 King James Bible. And so, uh, questions, questions. Answer thou not a fool according to his folly, lest, he be, uh, lest thou be like unto him. But also it says to answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. Brethren, hope, hopefully you can see as we build up our introduction to the message that what we find is this. There are questions that deserve an answer, and there are questions that don't. And this morning I'd like to preach on the subject of questions that deserve an answer. Questions that deserve an answer. As we consider questions that deserve an answer, we have to admit and acknowledge that there are questions that don't deserve one. There are questions that if it's a foolish question, an unlearned question that's asked from an unsincere heart that does not really desire to know the truth to begin with, those are questions that do not deserve an answer. However, in the Bible, we find the Bible is a book of questions. The first question asked in the Bible is asked in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. 
The last question that's asked in the Bible is found in Revelation chapter 17. And in between, there's a whole lot of questions. And listen here, there's no way this morning that we could take time to examine every single question in the Bible. There's just too many of them. Just too many of them, folks. But as I meditated upon this subject and considered the questions that are found in the Bible, I thought of three important questions in the Bible And these are questions that are asked, and I believe these are questions that deserve an answer. And I think this morning, we ought to seek to find out what the answers are. And yea, these may even be questions that are upon your hearts as far as questions you may have had. The first question I'd like for us to look at this morning is found in Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus Himself asked this question. And because it's the Lord that's asking the question, I believe that we can be relatively sure that He's sincere. Amen? I doubt the Lord, being the Son of God that He is, I doubt that He's going to ask a question in unsincerity. And so I believe that we can trust the the truth of this question. In verse 41, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye... Of Christ, whose son is he? They said unto him, The son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord, that's Jehovah, said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word. Neither does any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. <laughs> no doubt. He silenced the critics that afternoon, didn't he, folks? But listen here, I want you to notice the question there in verse 42, because it's an important question that everybody in this room should have already considered, and if you haven't considered it, you better get with considering it. What think ye of Christ, whose son is he? Do you realize that's the conflict of the ages? What think ye of Christ? Do you realize whether you go to heaven or whether you go to hell for eternity is determined on what you think about Jesus Christ? Do you realize that there are so many different things that are said about Jesus Christ, yet not all of them can possibly be right because things which are different are not the same? Somebody has to be right and somebody has to be wrong. Have you taken time to consider what you think about Christ? What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? Do you know who the, uh, who the Muslims say? Uh, they say, uh, uh, what, what think you of Christ? Well, they think he's a prophet. They think he's no different than any other prophet. As a matter of fact, they think he's a subordinate prophet to Muhammad. Now, as far as whose son they say he is, uh, to be honest with you, I'm not familiar with who the Muslims, who they say uh, uh, his father is. One thing's for sure, though, they deny the fact that God's his father. The Muslims say that Jesus Christ did not die on the cross and did not raise again from the dead. And they denied the fact that God is His Father. Now, Jesus in the Bible claimed that God was His Father. And so either Jesus is telling the truth or the Muslims are telling the truth. They can't both be telling the truth because they're saying different things. I know President Bush can get on national TV and say that Islam is a religion of peace, but religions of peace don't blow up buildings with people in them, folks. Religions of peace don't put suicide bombers on buses and blow buses up. Religions of peace don't go against peace. And so, he can invite the Muslim cleric to pray at the National Cathedral if he wants to. He can say all these flowery things about Islam. Listen here, you've got to reconcile the fact that Islam says one thing, the Bible says another, and both of them can't be right. Islam says that God has no son. The Bible says God has a son. Is it the same God? How could it be the same God? People say we're all just serving the same God. We just serve Him in different ways. If it's the same God, how come the God of Islam has no son, but the God of the Bible has a son? That can't be the same God. That's two different gods. And you know what? One of them's right and one of them's wrong. And you may not like it, but you've got to make a choice. Amen. You've got to decide. What think ye of Christ? You know what the Jewish Talmud says? The Jewish Talmud says this, that Jesus Christ is the bastard son of a Roman soldier. 
that Mary did not conceive of the Holy Ghost. She didn't conceive of the Holy Ghost. No, 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 not at all. Uh, listen here. Uh, she uh, committed fornication with a Roman soldier. Therefore, Jesus is not just a bastard. He's not even a full-blooded Jew. He's got Gentile blood. And so, listen here. There's nothing more blasphemous that could be said about Christ as far as the Jews are concerned. The fact that his mother would commit whoredom with a Gentile. And what do you think about that? What think ye of Christ? That's what they think of Christ. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Is it any surprise to you that Hollywood, which by the way is about 90% Jewish as far as its influence, is it any surprise to you that Hollywood puts out movies like The Last Temptation of Christ and Jesus Christ Superstar and all these different uh, things that blaspheme the name of God? Uh, isn't it amazing that that's how it is? What think ye of Christ? Well, that's what they think about Christ. How about Mo the Mormons? Listen here, let's talk about uh, uh, another religion. How about the Mormons? You know, the Mormons, you know what they say? They say that Jesus Christ is the half-brother of Lucifer. They say that he's the brother of Lucifer. And listen here, they say that the only reason Jesus got to be the Savior of the world is this, is because that when the gods all got together, that God liked Jesus' plan of redemption better than Lucifer's plan of redemption, and so Jesus got to be the Savior. I've got news for you. It wasn't Jesus' plan of redemption. The Bible tells us in Ephesians that God purposed the plan of redemption, and that's God the Father. Amen. Jesus Christ fulfilled the will of His Father, but it was the Father's plan, folks. And listen here, Jesus and Lucifer aren't spirit brothers either. So you talk about a sibling rivalry, please. That sounds like something out of Star Wars more than it does the Bible. Find me in the Bible where Lucifer and Jesus were brothers. You know what the Mormons teach? They teach this. They teach that Elohim, that's their name for God, they teach that Elohim actually came to the earth and had a physical relationship with Mary, and that's how Christ was conceived. Yeah. How many of y'all knew that? A couple of you. Listen here. Uh, that Christ came to the earth, I mean, excuse me, God came to the earth and had a physical sexual relationship with Mary, and that's how she conceived and bare a son. Now, wait a minute. I thought Matthew chapter 1, David, didn't... Now, you tell me. You, you read your Bible, don't you? Sometimes? Should you read it more than what you do? That's what I was thinking. Me too. All right, now. Doesn't Matthew chapter 1 say that, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. That's, that's what the Bible says. I know you've read that before, haven't you? All right? Now, that's Matthew chapter 1, I think, verse 25. Now, watch this now. Now, you know, I don't want to put you on the spot here because I know that you do go to public school, and sometimes that can be a disadvantage. But, with the limited knowledge you may have, and you may have much more than I know, but if Elohim, which they say is God, came to earth and had a physical relationship with Mary, if he had a physical relationship with her, would she still be a virgin? Wouldn't be a virgin, would she? Because she would have had a relationship with a man. And being a virgin means that a young lady hasn't had a relationship with a man. And by the way, young ladies, you're not supposed to have relationships with men until you get married. Amen? Yeah, yeah. The first relationship you ever have with a man better be your husband. Amen? Yeah. All right. At least it should be. And, and if it hasn't been, ask God to forgive you for that. Ask Him to forgive you that sin and give you a good man and recommit yourself to achieving that goal. But watch this now. If Elohim had that relationship, me and David are both agreeing. Are you all agreeing with us? That, that if Elohim came down and had a relationship with Mary, that she's not a virgin anymore, okay? And so, uh, what think ye of Christ? Well, you got one group that says he's a prophet, but he's not the son of God. You got another group that says he's the bastard son of a Roman soldier. You got another group that says that God came down in physical form and had a relationship with Mary, and that's where he came from. But how she would still be a virgin, that's still a mystery to us. And so we got all these different people that say all these different things about Christ. Now let me ask you, what do you think about him? What do you think about him? You say, I'm not Muslim. Okay, fine. You say, I'm not Mormon. Okay, fine. You say, I'm not Jewish. That's fine. But listen here, you still think something about Christ, don't you? Right. Now, what do you think about Him? What do you think about Him? I tell you what, you better think about Him, what that Bible says about Him. Amen. What think ye of Christ? Whose son is He? You better find out who this Bible says He is. You better find out what this Bible says about Him. I tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says this. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Let's look at that. Come to John chapter 1. You better find out what this Bible says about Him. 
John chapter 1. You better quit letting the TV preacher tell you what he thinks about him and quit letting the, letting the radio preacher tell you what he thinks about him and you better start finding out what this Bible says about him. Because here in John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word. Now notice that's a big W. That's a big W because we're talking about a big fellow. Uh, that's a big W because it's talking about the Word incarnate. It's not talking about the written Word as far as the Scriptures. It's talking about the, uh, the, the physical Word in the flesh, God in the flesh. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Now do you see that? Here's this Word. This Word is in the beginning. This Word was with God. But more importantly, this Word was God. Now the JW Bible, being the heretic uh, rubble of trash that it is, it says in the New World Translation that the Word was a God, and it's a small g. Small, isn't that right, Lucy? Lucy used to be a JW. I'm glad you got over that. Amen. I'm so glad you got over that. That's right. Now, make Mario stick to, stick to his diet and he'll be doing fine. All right, now, getting back with the message. Yeah, Mar Mario, we're not going to let, 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 let up on that diet thing. You're in trouble now. That's right. We're going to help you lose weight in spite of yourself. All right. Now, listen here. This Word, the Word was with God. The Word was God. Not was a God. The Word was God. And so, the Word was God. But look at verse 14. In verse 14 of this same chapter, and the Word was made flesh. Now, do you see that? Now, if the Word was made flesh, according to verse 1, who is the Word? If the Word was made flesh, who is it in verse 1, or excuse me, verse 14, that's being made flesh? God's being made flesh because the Word was God. So if the Word is God and the Word is being made flesh, then guess what? The Word, which is God, God is being made flesh. Now come to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. And this will show you another reason why you had to hold on to your King James Bible. Keep the new Bibles on hand at your house. You may run out of Charmin. 1 Timothy chapter 3. And it's a terrible thing to run out of tissue paper when you really need it. Amen. First Timothy chapter 3. You're right, that's good preach if you got that down, Daniel. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And verse 16 it says, And without controversy, no use fighting about it, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Amen. Now wait a minute. Isn't that what John chapter 1 just said? That God, the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh, so God was made flesh. So here Paul settles the matter. He says, God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. And so do we see there very plainly then that God was manifest in the flesh? All right, now, you know what the new Bibles do? They take out the Word God. The NIV, all the rest of them, they say, He who is revealed. He who is manifested. Let me ask you a question. Who's the He? Who is this He? He who? I mean, the Bible in the King James, very plain. God was manifest in the flesh. Why is it that the verses that deal with the deity of Christ, His blood atonement, His resurrection from the dead, and especially whenever folks are getting saved... Why is it the New Bibles choose to attack those verses? John R. Rice said one time that the changes in the New Bibles don't affect one major doctrine. I don't know what Bible he was reading from, but listen here, I can think of about 50 doctrines that the New Bibles change. Matter of fact, every time the New Bibles make a change, it's covering up one truth or another. Right. Those changes aren't done by accident. As much as that King James Bible is given by inspiration of God, you can say what you want to. These modern translations are given by the inspiration of the devil himself. Amen. The Bible says holy men of God spake as they are moved by the Holy Ghost. And when you've got lesbians like Virginia Mollencott working on the NIV, all that shows me is this, that unholy women spake as they were moved by Satan himself. We don't need a dyke giving us the Bible. Amen. That's right. I'm sorry, we don't need that. What we need is this. 
We need the Holy Ghost of God giving us the Scriptures according to holy men that He chose to use. And listen here, saved men and godly men and men that believe the book, not those that are using the book as an excuse to justify their sin. Amen. Because if you'll go read the NIV, you'll never find the word sodomite one time in the NIV. Why? Because a sodomite, she made sure that it didn't show up. Because she's trying to cover the tracks of her sin. She wrote a book called, Is the Homosexual My Neighbor? Where she said that God is not against homosexuality uh, as long as it's a monogamous relationship. Uh, he's only against shrine prostitutes and, and different things like that. He's not against two consenting adults that really love each other. So if Adam wants to love Steve, that's okay, just so Adam loves Steve and nobody else. I thank God this morning what Adam and Steve, it was Adam and Eve. Yeah. Amen. And listen here, uh, uh, Heather may have two mommies, but she's got problems. <laughs> The school put out that little booklet called Heather Has Two Mommies. When Heather's got two mommies, she's got some real problems. Amen. I'm glad I just had one mommy. <laughs> I'm glad my kids have one mommy. Amen. No doubt. All right, now, 1 Timothy 3. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed unto the world, received up in the glory. What think ye of Christ? I tell you what I think of Him. I think He's God manifest in the flesh. Amen. That's what I think of Him. You know why I think that of Him? Because that's what the Bible says about Him. I realize folks may not believe that. That's their problem. They've still got to deal with what the Bible says. See, we're not going to go about feelings and emotions. We're not going to go on what we think is right or what we want to be right or what we hope is right. We're going to go by what that book says because let God be true and every man a liar. And so what God says is true and what God says is not true isn't true. And so God was manifest in the flesh. What think ye of Christ? I tell you what I think of Him. I think He's the God manifest in the flesh. I tell you not only that. Uh, come over to Matthew 16. Not only that, but I think this of Him. Actually, come over to John 11. I told you Matthew 16. I think I'm going to go to John 11 instead. Chapter 11. Lazarus has died. And Jesus has shown up at the tomb. And He's dealing with the sisters of Lazarus. And Jesus tells her in verse 23, He says, Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto Him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection. Amen. And the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which had come into the world. Wow, that sounds like what Peter said in the passage we were going to turn to in Matthew 16. You know, Jesus asked Peter in Matthew 16, Whom do men say that I the Son of Man am? And some say thou art Elias, some say Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. And Jesus said, Alright, whom do you say that I am? And Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God that should come into the world. And you know what? That's who He is. The Christ, the Son of the living God. He's not just God manifest in the flesh. He's the Christ. He's the anointed one that God raised up to die for our sins. And that's who you need to trust in. You don't need to trust in some priest. My grandfather, before he passed away, when he was still in the hospital, before I ever got there, you know, when he found out that he was most likely terminal and so forth, you know, the first thing he did? He sent for a priest. And some priest came in and uh, gave him last rites. And when I called my grandmother before we actually got there to see how he was doing, she says, well, you know, he's okay. He's ready to meet God. The priest came in and gave him last rites. I've got news for you. The priests don't have a real good track record for, give, for forgiving sins. Half of them are pedophiles. How are they going to forgive your sins? When they're messing with the altar boys and doing some of the wickedness they're doing, how are they going to forgive your sins? You say, well, Baptist preachers do the same thing. Hey, they might, but then again, we never said we could forgive anyone's sins, though. I don't deny the fact that there aren't some Baptist preachers that misbehave and do some things. Sure, there's some Baptist preachers that are perverts like there are any other group. But let me say something to you. Last time I checked, us Baptist preachers weren't telling anybody we could absolve them from their sins before they left this world. 
And so they sent for the priest, and the priest came and gave him last rites. While I was there um, visiting with him, his sister came over, his, uh, my Aunt Agnes, which is his sister. She came over and brought a friend of hers with her. And this friend was an older woman as well. And this, this woman is what the Catholics call a Catholic lay minister. In other words, she's not a priest. You know, you can't be a female priest in the Catholic Church. But they've got such a shortage of priests that they've actually ordained these lay workers to administer Holy Communion. And so my grandfather can't get out of church uh, because of his condition to go anywhere, of course. And so this woman comes to the house. And here's me and Angie sitting on the couch. And uh, this woman's getting ready to leave. She says, well, before we leave, Joe, uh, let, let's give you Holy Communion. I'm like, oh, brother, what's this woman doing? She's not a priest. And so uh, then I realized that the Catholic Church, they authorize these, these lay ministers and so forth. And so she uh, comes over and does her little mumble jumbo and holds up that little wafer and says, uh, this is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And man, I want to come up out of that chair and grab that thing out of her hand and go flush it down the toilet in front of her. Because guess what? That's where that Lamb of God ended up anyway. Because before the end of the day, Gramps had a bowel movement and the Lamb of God went into the city sewer system. You understand that? I'm not being blasphemous with you. I'm not being any more blasphemous than they are right. saying that yeah. wafer is the Lamb of God. Listen here, the Lamb of God is not a wafer, folks. The Lamb of God is sitting on the right hand of the yeah. Father this morning, risen again in His glory, waiting to save any sinner that will come to Him by repentance and faith, and He's coming back in the clouds of glory. He's not getting flushed down the toilet. Amen. Make sure you've got the right Lamb of God. That's why I don't think my grandfather was saved. I don't think he's saved because of this. You can't accept the truth without acknowledging the error. And the danger of this easy believism that our churches are promoting these days, this one, two, three, pray after me, we're letting people accept the truth without acknowledging the error. And God will never save you like that. You must acknowledge the error to accept the truth. That's what repentance is all about. Repentance is you acknowledging what's wrong about you. And listen here, you not only have to repent of your sins, you've got to repent of what you've been wrong about as far as your religion. And that I know of, unless my grandfather made a decision in his heart that I just don't know about, he never did that. And if he did it, why didn't he say something about it? You mean to tell me that my grandfather could have gotten saved and then not been concerned about my grandmother before he left this world? You mean my grandfather could have gotten saved and not been concerned about his two sons, my dad and my uncle, before he left this world? No, I, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I wish my grandfather would have got in, but I don't think he did. I don't think he did. But you know what? I take comfort in this. My grandfather may have not got in, but there's some other grandfathers I can try to win. I may have not got him in, but somebody else's grandfather might listen. And I'm not discouraged by the one that didn't get in. I'm encouraged by the fact there's still plenty of them out there for us to witness to so we can try to get them in. Amen. At the funeral on Friday, the, my uncle told me that they found some rosary beads that came from the Holy Land that had been blessed. And they put those rosary beads in his hands so that when they shut the coffin, he was buried with his rosary beads. And I thought to myself, if he's in the place I think he's in, the last thing he could care about right now are those rosary beads. And listen here, even if I'm wrong and he was saved and he's in heaven, you think he's worried about rosary beads up in heaven? I don't think so. He's not worried about rosary Listen here, I don't care where he's at in eternity. He's not worried about rosary beads right now. Listen here, that's the deception of religion. And you better make sure, what think ye of Christ? You better make sure you believe what that Bible says and not what some religion says. That leads me to my next question that deserves an answer. What think ye of Christ? That's a question that deserves an answer. But you know what? It's a question only you can answer for yourself. I know what I think about Christ, but what do you think about Christ? And what you think about Christ is it what this Bible says? It better be. It better be. Second of all, take your Bible and come to the book of Acts. Come to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. 
In Acts 16, look at this. Acts chapter 16. You know, I think of, of Gramps and so forth, and the whole time I was there, he kept asking for a drink of water. I don't know how many times I gave him a drink of water. Changed his diaper. Ministered to him in every way I could, knowing that he had a short time left. I don't know how many times I gave that man a sip of water. One day I was in the kitchen of their house. I think it was like Friday of last week. And as I put the ice in the cup and filled the cup up with water at the sink, the thought just kind of dawned on me that if he didn't get saved, he was going to a place where there are no drinks of water. No drinks of water. That rich man in hell lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and said, Send Lazarus. And he may dip his finger in water and cool my parched tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. My brethren, we certainly need to get more of a burden for the lost than what we really have. I'm afraid sometimes we're playing games with it. And we can go knock on doors and hand out tracts and you know, feel good about ourselves because we did something for God. But I tell you what, we better get more of a sense of urgency about those that God brings us into contact with that do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Here in Acts 16, Paul and Silas have wound up in jail. I remember when some of us at Beaufort wound up in jail. People said that wasn't right, that you would go to jail for street preaching. I was like, take it up with Paul. But it says here in verse 25, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of a sleep, see, that's trouble. That's trouble. Because... Um, you weren't supposed to go to sleep. Right. See, the keeper of the prison was responsible for the lives of those prisoners. And if any prisoner escaped, it was his life for their life. And so he wasn't supposed to be sleeping on the watch. And so you can imagine how troubled he is. And the keeper of the prison, while waking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. Now, that may sound extreme, but in his mind, he's thinking of all the tortures they're going to do to him before they kill him because he's let these prisoners escape. And it would have been much easier just to take his sword and get it over with himself. But Paul cried with a loud voice. Loud voice. Must have been a street preacher. Saying, uh, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. And he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. Verse 30. Here's a question that deserves an answer. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Boy, I tell you what. Now there's a question. What must I do to be saved? Now if a Catholic priest would have been there, the priest would have said, Well, son, do the best that you can. Make sure you've been baptized in the one true Holy Mother Church. Keep the sacraments. And do the best that you can in your life. Be good to your fellow man. And when you leave this world, you might go to heaven. That doesn't sound real like much of a sure thing, though, does it? You know, uh, if, uh, if a Church of Christ elder would have been there, he would have said, well, you know, uh, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. Ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. All right? Uh, and then endure to the end or you'll lose it. That doesn't sound very reassuring, does it, Mario? I mean, uh, if you would have had a, a Mormon elder there, it would have been submit to what the Mormon church says. If a JW would have been there, it would have been submit to what the Watchtower says. Uh, if it would have been any other group, any other group, they would have said, uh, believe what our group says. But I like the answer Paul gave. And not just Paul, but Silas. Because it says, and they answered him and said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Notice they did not say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized. 
They did not say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, be baptized, and join the church. They did not say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, be baptized, join the church, and give money. They did not say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, be baptized, join the church, give money, and speak in tongues. No, they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. You want to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what you do to get saved. But listen here, you got to make sure you believe the right things about Jesus Christ. See, that's why we had the first question be, what think ye of Christ? Let me say something to you. You're not ever getting saved till you understand who Christ really is. You can't be saved and not really understand who He is. I mean, if you don't believe that He's God manifest in the flesh, if you don't believe He's the fullness of the Godhead bodily, if you don't believe He's the Christ, the Son of the living God that came into the world, if you don't believe that, how are you going to be saved? Especially in light of the fact that the Bible says that He died for you according to the Scriptures, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. How are you going to be saved if you don't believe who He is and what He did? And so this fellow says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do? You know, notice this question is different than what the rich young ruler said in Luke 19. In Luke 19, the rich young ruler, he said, What good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Notice that guy's, uh, listen here, his priorities are mixed up. Because he was thinking there was something he could do to inherit eternal life. In the sense of works, what good thing shall I do? Do I need to get baptized? Do I need to join the church? Do I need to give money? Uh, what do I need to do? You say it, Lord, and I'll do it. All right? uh, sell all your goods, give them all uh, away to the poor, and take up your cross and follow me. Uh, uh. And the Bible says he went away grieved. See, uh, Jesus listed six commandments. The, the young ruler said, what good thing shall I do? Jesus listed six of the Ten Commandments. He said, uh, well, don't steal. Don't murder anybody. Don't covet. Honor your mother and father. And goes through all these commandments, right? It's noteworthy, though, the four commandments that he didn't mention. Because that's where the one, the, the one thing, that, you know, he said, one thing thou lackest, the one thing he was lacking was those first four commandments. What was the first commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. What was the second commandment? Thou shalt not make any graven images unto thee. What was the third commandment? Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. What was the fourth commandment? Uh, 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 keep the Sabbath day. As far as uh, honor the Sabbath day. Keep the Sabbath day. Notice all four of those commandments had to do with a person's personal relationship with God. Listen here, a man may not steal, but that doesn't mean he has a relationship with God. A man may not commit adultery, but that doesn't mean he has a relationship with God. A man may honor his mother and father, but that doesn't mean he has a relationship with God. But listen here, to have no other gods before him, you've got to have a relationship with him. To not make any graven images, you've got to have a relationship with him. To not take his name in vain, you've got to have a relationship with him. And so the one thing the rich young ruler was lacking was a personal relationship with God. That's why Jesus said, one thing thou lackest. And you know what? Do you know what the one thing that was keeping him from getting that personal relationship? His possessions. Because he didn't possess his possessions. His possessions possessed him. And that's why when Jesus said, go, sell all that thou hast, and give to the poor, and come, take up your cross, and follow after me. It grieved him, because those possessions had such possession on him. Here, this fella, he's asking a different question altogether. He's saying, sirs, what must I do to be saved? I just want to be saved. I'm not right with God. I'm wrong. God knows I'm wrong. I know I'm wrong. I want to be right. How do I get right with Amen. God? Amen. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Hey, that's a question that deserves an answer. I'm glad they gave the right answer. There's nothing else involved. Salvation is by grace through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. There's nothing you can add to it. There's nothing you can take away from it. And listen here, if you add to the gospel, you've perverted it. If you take away from the gospel, you've perverted it. 
if you change it in any way, you've perverted it. You want to be saved? All right, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. It's that simple, brethren. It's no more difficult than that. But what it means is this, a true, sincere belief in the heart. It's more than head knowledge. It's more than saying some prayer with your mouth to satisfy the preacher. No, it's more than that. It's you really believing in your heart that you are a sinner, that you deserve hell, and that you are on your way to hell, and that Christ interposed His precious blood on your behalf so you wouldn't have to go to hell, and it's you repenting of your sin and receiving the blood that He shed for you. That's believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's being saved. And listen here, and thy house. I tell you what, if you'd get in, your kids would get in. That's right. And thy house, and thy house, and thy house. You know what? The Bible shows that that fellow got in, and not just him, but his whole house. I tell you what, nothing more vexing for a parent than to know their child went to hell. Nothing more vexing than that. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a bad feeling. Uh, I have as far as my grandfather, wishing that he would have made it some different decisions in life. But nevertheless, though, I can't imagine one of my own children going to a lake of fire. And listen here, if they go, I tell you what, they're going to go in spite of the prayers of Daddy. If they go, they're going to go in spite of the witnessing from Mama and Daddy. If they go, they're going to go in spite of all they've heard at church. You understand that? If they go, there's some roadblocks we're putting in their way along the way. I ho- all I can hope is one of those speed bumps gets their attention and causes them to turn around and go back the other way. But if they go, it won't be for lack of Mama and I trying to win them and make sure they know the right thing. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And thy house. God wants you to get your house in. You know what? Noah didn't get nobody else on the ark but his family, but he got them. That's right. Noah didn't get no one else but his family, but he at least got his family. That's what I want, brethren. We may not win nobody else but our own, but let's win our own. Let's make sure the family circle is unbroken on the other side. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. That's a question worth answering. Let me give you one more. Let me give you one more. We could go on all day with these different questions of the Bible. But let me give you one more this morning. Come to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. And Matthew chapter 27, notice this. What think ye of Christ? That's a question that's looking for an acknowledgement of the Savior. What must I do to be saved? That's a question that's looking for the assurance of salvation. But last of all this morning, Matthew 27, it says in verse 19, And when he was set down on the judgment seat, this is speaking of Pilate, his wife said unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said unto them, verse 22, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? And they all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. I tell you another question that deserves an answer. What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? Here's Jesus standing before you this morning. He stands before you with a crown of thorns upon His head. He stands before you in garments that have been ripped and tattered from the beating that He's taken. He stands before you, and as He stands before you, a a pool of blood begins to form around His feet because His body's been flayed open and there are arteries and veins that are spurting blood. Listen, it wasn't like the movies. It wasn't like the paintings where you have a trickle of blood here and a trickle of blood here and a sad look on Jesus' face. No, here's the Lamb of God. Uh, the beard has been literally ripped off His face as the blood oozes out of the wounds. Uh, the thorns, which were about four to six inches long, have been, uh, they've taken the, the rod and beat those into His skull. And so here He is standing there in those tattered clothes with that crown of thorns, with that pool of blood forming around His feet. 
And Pilate says, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? Let me ask you this morning, what are you going to do with him? What are you going to do with him? See, I know what I've done with him. I've received him. By God's grace, I've received him. What are you going to do with him? Because you know what? The same question Pilate asked himself 2,000 years ago, down through the hollows of time, you've got to ask yourself that question too. What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? What are you going to do? Will you receive him? Or will you be like that crowd that said, away with him, crucify him? See, every time you reject him, you know what you do? You crucify the Son of God to yourself afresh. That's what Hebrews says. That's right. You put him to an open shame. Hebrews 6 says so. When you reject him, you put him to an open shame and cause him to be crucified afresh. You know what that means? You're as guilty of his blood as those that literally killed him 2,000 years ago. You're guilty before God. What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? You know what? I believe, this is my opinion. I'm giving you my opinion here. I believe of all the questions that are in the Bible, and boy, there's a slew of them, isn't there? I believe of all the questions that are in the Bible, that's the most important question that's ever asked in the Scriptures. You know why it's so important? Because Pilate's not saying, What shall my wife do with Jesus, which is called Christ? What shall Barabbas do with Jesus, which is called Christ? No, Pilate is being forced into the position of asking, What shall I do with Jesus, which is called Christ? You know what, for those of you that are married here this morning, it doesn't matter what your spouse has done with Christ. What matters is this, what have you done with Christ? For those of you that are here with children today, uh, it doesn't matter what your children may have done with Christ. It matters what have you done with Christ. For you older kids that have an understanding of things and can receive what I'm saying, it doesn't matter what your parents have done with Christ. What matters is what have you done with Christ. See? And so, what have I, what shall I do with Jesus, which is called Christ? It's the most important question because it answers the most important personal need of your life. Where will you spend eternity? Because if you receive Christ, you'll spend eternity in heaven. But if you reject Christ, you'll spend eternity in hell. Therefore, beyond any shadow of the doubt, without all controversy, the most important question in the Bible that deserves an answer is what shall I do with Jesus Christ? I'm glad I received him. In September of 1988, I received him. You know what? He received me too. Anyone that receives him, he receives them. Anyone that rejects him, though, he rejects them too. Anyone that loves him, he loves. But anyone that loathes him, he loathes. Don't you be deceived by this world into thinking that God loves everybody. God so loved the world, past tense. Past, you ever caught that? God so loved the world, past tense. That's not present tense. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. But listen here. If you reject the love of God that was manifested on Calvary for your sins, God will reject you too. God will not love you if you do not love His Son. God is angry with the wicked every day. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. How can a loving God put people in hell? I'll tell you how. That same loving God is a just God. He's a righteous God. And listen here. His love will not compromise His righteousness. And you know what? Let me say something to you. God doesn't put anyone in hell that He loves. God only puts people in hell that He hates. You understand that? See, God, unlike what this world will tell you, is capable of hate. And He's manifested His love toward you in giving His Son for your sins. But if you reject that love and despise His Son, God will despise you too. For the Bible says, Behold, thou hatest all workers of iniquity. That's right. I know that's sobering. I know you've been taught that God is this great big kiss in the sky who just wants to give everybody a big bear hug whether they love Him or not. God is merciful and God is gracious. And if it wasn't for His mercy and grace, we'd all be going to hell, folks. I did lots of stupid things that should have got me killed before I got saved. 
And had I died in that lost condition, I would have gone to hell. God's mercy and grace has preserved me down through the years. And I thank God for it. But you know what? When eternity comes, and death comes knocking at your door, you better hope that you've done the right thing with Jesus Christ. Questions that deserve an answer. Some questions, brethren, don't even waste your time. You know why? Because it's foolish questions, unlearned questions, from people without sincere hearts. And if you try to answer it, do you know that all you do is gender more strife? That's why the Bible tells you, that answer thou not a fool according to his folly, lest thou be like unto him. But you know what? There are some real, sincere questions, important questions, that deserve an answer. We've only scratched the surface with these three this morning. But I hope that I've given you something to think about. Questions that deserve an answer. What think you of Christ? That's a question that seeks an acknowledgement of the Savior. What must I do to be saved? That's a question that seeks an assurance of salvation. But last of all, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? That's a question that seeks an acceptance of of His sacrifice. I'm glad that God loved us so much that He would give us His Son on our behalf. You ought to be glad too. And if you've never received Him as your Lord and Savior, why not let today be that day? You know, when I look at my grandfather, God gave him 83 years on this earth. 83 years. You know what? He got the three score and ten, and if by reason of strength, he got his four score plus three. He got more than what the Bible even promises us. But you know what? I know for a fact that over the last 30 years of his life, from age 53 to age 83, I know he got witness to. Because even before I got saved and started witnessing to him, my mother witnessed to him. And listen here. I don't see how a man goes 83 years in America without getting somebody else to witness to him too. There's a, you all have heard of Charlie Brown, the cartoon character? Uh, my gramps told me about a fellow that he used to work with at the Army Corps of Engineers whose name was Charlie Brown who went to a Baptist church there in Huntington. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if before even my mother witnessed to my grandfather, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if old Charlie Brown didn't witness to him about the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. The point I'm trying to make is this. God can give you opportunity after opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. But you know what the devil does? The devil tries to delay you one day at a time. One day at a time. And you know what? He steals one day from you at a time till you have no days left. And then you leave this world lost. You wind up in a devil's hell. And don't tell me you can't remember all the opportunities that you had. Because if I remember my Bible correctly, I believe Abraham said to the rich man, Son, remember. Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thou thy good things and Lazarus evil, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. Don't tell me that people in hell don't have their memory. They do. Don't be like those who have had opportunity after opportunity and let it pass them by and die and go to hell. Be one of those wise few that embrace the opportunity while you have it. Let's stand for prayer. This is your opportunity. This is your chance. Questions that deserve an answer. I wonder if I let you testify this morning. I wonder how you would answer those questions. I wonder what you think about Christ today. I wonder how you think a person gets saved. Most importantly, I wonder what will you do with Jesus, which is called Christ. I thank you for being here this morning. It's my privilege and honor to preach to you. But you know what? It's all vain. It's all vain. 
if you walk out that door lost. All the preaching in the world won't make a difference if you will not receive and accept the truth. I wonder if there's anyone here this morning that with an uplifted hand would say, Preacher, pray for me. I'm not saved. I need to be, and I'd like to be. Would you pray for me? Anybody at all this morning with an uplifted hand? Preacher, I'm not saved. I need to be. I'd like to be. Would you pray for me? Anyone at all? Listen here, quit worrying about what the person next to you thinks. Quit worrying about what I'll think. All that matters is what does God think? When you leave this world, you're not going to stand before me in judgment. When you leave this world, you won't stand before your neighbor in judgment. When you leave this world, you're going to stand before God in judgment. And the only opinion that will matter in that day is what he thinks. Anybody at all with an uplifted hand would say, Preacher, pray for me. I need to be saved. Anyone at all. All right, the will of the Lord be done. I would not feel right with myself or at peace with myself if I preached a message like that and did not give you an opportunity to do something with it. But I'm going to pray for you. That God will speak to your heart and minister to your needs and help you to make the decisions in life that you need to make. For you Christians, I pray that all of us can learn to have a sincere and true burden because it's not just the lives of our lost ones, our lost loved ones that hang in the balance. It's the lives of other people's lost loved ones as well. And listen here. We may not be able to win our own, but let's do our very best to try to win somebody else's. Aren't you glad somebody won you? If you can be won, then somebody else can be won too. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, thank you, Lord, for this day. Father, thank you for your word. And Father, thank you for the truth that's contained therein. Thank you, Lord, for the things that you've let us see in your book this day. And Father, we pray that you might bring forth fruit in our lives for these things. Father, there's some questions in life that deserve an answer. And Father, I'm sure that we only skimmed the surface this morning as far as addressing these three questions. And Father, I'm sure there's so many more that deserve answers as well. But Father, I pray that the people that have come today might consider these three questions. And Father, I, might, I pray they might consider how they answer these questions. And if their answer isn't the right one, I pray they'll get the right one. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us all, dear God, as Christians, those of us that are saved, to be truly concerned about the lost and have a burden for reaching them. And Lord, I pray that you'd give us opportunities to go out and preach the word into all this world, to go into the highways and hedges and seek out that which is lost. And Father, I pray that we might bring some folks back into the fold. And Lord, we'll thank you for all these things. Father, please bless this congregation. Thank you for these people, dear Lord, that have come. And Father, we hope to see them again soon. Father, please, would you just watch over us for the good. Give us a good afternoon of rest. Bring us back refreshed this evening. And Lord, we look forward to hearing from Brother Muller and the work going on in Mexico tonight. And Lord, we'll thank you for all these things. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and ask them. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. May the Lord bless you.